In a WPF application, or really any front-end application, it's pretty common that you're going to have to load something, whether it be loading data from a database, getting data from a web API, there's going to be loading, but I want my users to enjoy loading and look at something that's visually appealing while the load is occurring. So that being said, in this UI workshop, we're going to be creating a custom loading spinner control. So here in Visual Studio, we are going to start off by creating a new project for our control. And this is going to be a WPF custom control library. And we're going to call this the loading spinner control. And let's go ahead and create that. And this project template scaffolds out a bunch of stuff for us. So we have our control. It inherits from control. We override the default style. And that default style comes from our themes, generic.xaml, the location of generic.xaml, and the naming all matters. And here is the default style for our control that we're going to implement for our loading spinner. So let's start off by, of course, renaming this to the loading spinner. And we fix that name in our style as well. And let's also get rid of this gigantic comment. So most importantly, our loading spinner is going to have to know if a load is in progress or not. So we're going to create a dependency property for that. Just the good old prop DP snippet. Generate that. And this is going to be the is loading property. So if you're unfamiliar with dependency properties, it's basically properties in WPF that support binding. So we'll be able to bind to this is loading property. And this will be a Boolean. The owner class is this loading spinner. And the default value, of course, will be false. So of course, we're going to use this property in our custom style inside the control template. It's going to be a spinner, so it's going to be a circle. And to do that, we're going to have an ellipse. And we'll just set a default width and height here. So 100 by 100, so again, going to be a circle. And we'll give it a stroke of black so that we can actually see it. And most importantly, the visibility is going to be dependent on the is loading dependency property. So we can do a template binding and access is loading. So since we're inside a control template for the loading spinner, the template binding will allow us to access any of the dependency properties on our loading spinner. But of course, is loading is a Boolean and visibility is, if we look at this, a visibility. So we're going to have to convert this Boolean into a visibility enum. And to do that, we can use the built in WPF converter. So let's get some resources into this control template and we will use a Boolean to visibility converter very convenient and we'll give it a key so we can reference it in our binding and the key will just be boolean the visibility converter and now let's go ahead and use this in our binding so the converter will be our boolean the visibility converter perfecto so before we go any further with this and actually turn it into a spinner let's go ahead and set this up in our demo so i have just a checkbox to toggle whether we are loading or not and underneath this we're going to have our loading spinner so let's define that. And of course, we have to add a project reference to our loading spinner control project. So let's go ahead and do that. Add a project reference, the loading spinner control. And now we can do a control dot on the loading spinner, add the namespace for our loading spinner custom control. And let me just rename this to custom. And let's put this in grid row one and give it some margin. And of course, we're going to bind is loading on our loading spinner, that dependency property that we just set up we will bind is checked on our checkbox to is loading. So the element name, we have a name for this checkbox, CV is loading. So if this is checked, is loading will be true and our loading spinner, of course, will then be visible. So let's check it. And there we go. There is our loading spinner that doesn't actually spin, but at least we are showing this and toggling it based on whether or not we are loading. So before we bother making the spin, I want to cut out a little piece of the ellipse so that we can actually see that it is spinning because otherwise we would just have the circle spinning but it would just be spinning in place it wouldn't really be showing us anything so what we can do is add a stroke dash array to this ellipse and let's just throw a 10 in here and take a look at how this looks and as you can see we have dashes that have a length of 10 and the gap between each dash is a length of 10 as well so if we add another value to this say 1 then our dashes are a length of 10 and they have a gap of one between them. So I want my loading spinner to have just a single dash that goes about three fourths the size of the control. And then the gap, I want to be a quarter of the control. So like from here to up here. So we're basically just cutting out a little pie slice from our ellipse so that when this is spinning, we can see that little pie slice that we cut out, spin around, and we'll be able to get some visual feedback that this is loading. And of course, we're dealing with this perimeter, so it's all based on circumference. 
And I did do the calculation. The circumference of a circle that has a diameter of 100 has a circumference of about 314. So 3 fourths of 314 is 235. So that'll be the length of my dash. And then I want the gap to be 25% of the circumference. So 25% of the circumference is about 78. And there we go. Now we have this little chunk taken out. So when this starts spinning, we'll be able to notice that it actually is spinning. So finally, let's make it spin. So to get this thing spinning, we're going to need an animation. And animations are done inside of storyboards. And that storyboard is going to be triggered by an event trigger. So let's get into our ellipse triggers. And we're going to have an event trigger. And the event that's going to start the spinning will just be the loaded event. So whenever this control gets loaded, we'll just start spinning immediately. And to do that spinning, we will begin a storyboard. And let's set up a storyboard in here for our animation. And this storyboard is just going to constantly repeat forever. So it's going to keep on spinning. And the animation we're going to do inside the storyboard will be a double animation. And we're going to end up animating the rotation of this ellipse. And that animation is going to be from 0 to 360. So we're going to rotate it in a full circle, 360 degrees. So now how do we rotate this ellipse? Well, that will be done with a render transform. And this render transform will be a rotate transform. And we'll give this rotate transform a name, just call it rotation. And we'll give it just a start angle of zero. So now that we have this rotate transform, this is going to be animated inside of this double animation. So this is going to be the target element. And we're going to target this angle property and make sure this is what gets animated from zero to 360. So to do that, all we have to do is set the target name to our rotation, rotate transform element. So let's just paste that in there. And of course, the target property on the rotation, rotate transform, is going to be the angle. So we're going to start loading. And OK, so it's there's definitely some kind of rotation in there, but it's not like rotating in place. It's rotating around like a really odd point. What I wanted to do is rotate around the center of the element, not whatever it's doing right now. So to do that, what we have to do is set the render transform origin. And if we set this to 0 0.5, 0 0.5, it'll rotate around the center and it'll rotate in place rather than I believe what it was doing is rotating around the top left of the element. So we're just going woo all the way around. And there we go. Look at that loading spinner. So we're loading. I get to look at this nice spinner. I'm pretty satisfied. But I want to make this a little bit more customizable. So maybe we want a different color for the stroke. Maybe we want different sizing. Maybe I want it to be a little bit thicker. So stroke thickness. Maybe we want that to be 5. So yeah, let's actually see how this looks with a stroke thickness of 5. So here we go, and what the heck, why is it, what happened to my little piece that I cut out of the circle, where did it go? It seems that our stroke dash array is not working with a stroke thickness of 5. What if I make this 1? Does it go back to normal? Yeah, it works. But then if I make it 5, it doesn't work. And why is that? Well, for some reason, these stroke dash array values need to be divided by the stroke thickness. So if we take 235 and divide it by 5, we get 47 and 78 divided by 5 typing this into my calculator right now we get 16 and now okay now our gap is back and we can see that this is spinning so I'm gonna be honest I don't exactly know why these need to be divided by the stroke thickness because I don't think the stroke thickness really changes our circumference but that is what needs to be done so we're gonna have to do a little bit more to calculate the stroke dash array if we allow the stroke thickness to be customizable. And even if we didn't make the stroke thickness customizable and just left it at 1 and then reverted everything back to 235 and 78, even if we changed the width and height to say something like 50, then the stroke dash array still wouldn't work because our circumference has changed. So basically the stroke dash array is dependent on the diameter, which is our equal width and height, and the stroke thickness. So we need to calculate the stroke dash array based on those values, and that's just gonna be such a pain to set up. But this is the UI workshop. We're ready to take on this challenge. So let's begin by setting up dependency properties to allow the customization of the width and height and the stroke thickness. So of course, these are gonna be 
dependency properties. So we're going to have a dependency property for the diameter of the spinner. And this will be a double. Our inner class is the loading spinner. And by default, we'll have this as 100. Not actually 100, 100.0, 100 because this is a double. If you just left it at 100, it would throw an error, because 100 is just an int. So got to make sure we add the 0, 0.0 and make it a double. And then we also need a stroke thickness. So we'll just call this thickness, and this will be a double as well. I think we can make it a double. Enter class the loading spinner, and the default value we'll just have as 1. So I'm still not sure if this should be a double or an int, and how I usually check is I go to the stroke thickness on this ellipse, and I can peek the definition of this, and we can see the type is a double. So of course our dependency property should be a double as well. And now that we have these dependency properties, we can template bind to them. So the thickness, and then for width and height, we will template bind to the diameter. So now in my demo, I can set these properties. So I want the thickness, we'll do 5, and the diameter, we'll do 150. And the default value type does not match the type of property thickness. So I went on that rant about how the default value needs to be a double and not an int, and I forgot to put a point zero at the end. So here we go, let's start loading, and there we go. We got our thickness, it's a little bit bigger than before, and of course our stroke dash rate is broken because we're using a thicker value and a larger diameter, so it no longer matches what we had when the diameter was 100 and the thickness was one. So we need to calculate the stroke dash array from the diameter and the thickness. And to do that, we're gonna use a multi-binding and a multi-value converter. So to set all that up, we're gonna have to set the stroke dash array with some XAML. So let's get rid of this up here, and we'll set this value via a multi-binding, and that multi-binding is gonna depend on the diameter, and that diameter property comes from the relative source templated parent. So the templated parent, of course, is our loading spinner, since we're inside the control template for the loading spinner. And we're also going to depend on the thickness property of the loading spinner as well. So we're going to take both of these values into the multi-binding and convert them into a stroke dash array. So how will we convert both of these values? Well, of course, we're going to need a converter that takes in the diameter and takes in the thickness inside this multi-binding and gives us back a stroke dash array. So let's set up a new folder in our project for converters. And we'll give this a nice long and explicit name. We'll call it the diameter and thickness to stroke dash array converter. Gotta love it. And I'm not sure I've done multi-value converters on my channel, but usually for converters we use an I value converter, but not in this case. We need an I multi-value converter because we're getting multiple values into the converter. So let's implement this interface. And as you can see, we get an array of values that need to be converted. So let's do some validation real quick. So if the value's length is less than two, we don't have enough values. Or if we cannot parse the first value, so value zero, and we have to convert this to a string in order to parse it, and we'll output the result if we can parse it to a variable called diameter. Or if we can't parse the second value, so values one, get the string of that. If we can't parse it to a double, that will put in a variable called thickness, then we'll just return zero because we simply can't do the calculation because we don't have enough values. The first value wasn't a double for the diameter and the second value wasn't a double for the thickness. But if we get past all that, then we can do the conversion. So as I mentioned earlier, I want the dash's line length to be 75% of the circumference and I want the gap that we cut out to be 25% of the circumference. So that being said, we're gonna need that circumference of course. And I think there's a saying that goes something like, I ate and I ate till I fell on the floor. Circumference equals 2 pi r. So that's what we have to do. 2 pi r. So let's get pi. And of course, we can use math for that. Math.pi. And for some reason, pi is the suggested value at the very top. And it knows to suggest this value because we have circumference here, I assume. Because look, down here, if we do math dot, pi is not the top value. So IntelliSense, pretty dang smart. So circumference equals 2 pi r. So we got pi and 2r, that's 2 times the radius. So 2 times the radius is the diameter, which we have. So as I mentioned, we want the line length of the dash to be 75% of the circumference. So we'll multiply that by 0 0.75. And then I want the gap length. So the gap that I cut out 
I could do circumference times 0 0.25 and do 25%, but I'll just do the circumference minus the line length. So both of these will always add up to the circumference. And now we have to return both of these values. So how do we do that? Well, again, same thing we did for stroke thickness where we peak the definition and saw we needed to double. We can also peak the stroke dash array and see this is a double collection. So that's what we have to return here, a new double collection. And we can simply pass in an array containing both of those values. So the line length comes first and then the gap length. So what about thickness? Well, I mentioned earlier that we actually have to divide the line length and the gap length by the thickness for whatever reason. So we're going to go ahead and do that on these values that we return. So I'm going to snag the name of this converter and use this in my generic.xaml. So we're going to have a resource for that. Make sure we give it a key. And now we can set the converter for our multi-binding to be the diameter and thickness to stroke dash array converter. Nice long name. And of course we have to import this converter as well. So do a control dot, bring in our converter's namespace. So we should be good to go. We have a custom diameter and a custom thickness, but we should still get the gap cut out of the perimeter of our circle. So we start loading and there we go. We got our loading spinner. So let's make this a little bit bigger. Make sure we still get our gap so that we can see it spinning. So we'll make it 200 and we'll give this a thickness maybe 10. That's probably a lot, but we're going to go with that anyways. And there we go. Same kind of thing. And if we go smaller, so make the thickness one, there we go. Looking good. So this thing is very customizable, but let's make it even more customizable just for fun. So what about stroke? We might want a different color. So let's get a property on our loading spinner for the color. So just another dependency property for this, the color property. And what is the type? So same thing. Just going to peek the definition of this stroke property. And the type we need is a brush. So there we go. The owner class is the loading spinner. And the default value, we can do brushes black. So the default value will be black. And now let's template bind to this. So the color dependency property that we have on our control. So default value looks good. Let's go ahead and do a different color. So we'll do red. And there's a nice red spinner. So I guess the last thing that's kind of cool to customize is the stroke dash cap. So we set this to round and it's kind of hard to see while it's spinning. So let's turn off the spinning real quick. Then as you can see, the ends of our dashes are rounded. So that's kind of cool. We can make them triangle. Look at that little triangles on the end. So why not? Let's make it customizable. Another dependency property. We'll call this the cap property. The type of this is a pen line cap. Can't say I've used that before. The inner class will be the loading spinner and the default value. We'll just do flat. So same thing, just template bind to the cap. We can set that value out here. We'll do triangle. And there we go, we got our triangles. Let's go ahead and get this thing spinning again. Uncomment that. And looking good. So there is the loading spinner. So we created a custom control, set up a bunch of dependency properties to customize how the loading spinner appears, such as the height and width, the color, the thickness, and of course the stroke dash cap, very important. And then we set up a storyboard when the control gets loaded so that it rotates. We also set up the stroke dash array so that we cut out a little piece of the spinner and can actually see it spinning. And to calculate the stroke dash array, we needed the diameter of the spinner and the thickness of the spinner stroke. So we set up a multi-binding for both of those values and converted them via a custom multi-value converter. And I really do enjoy this loading spinner and can definitely see myself using this in my own applications. So I might eventually publish this as a NuGet package. And if I do, I'll leave a link to the NuGet page in the description. Anyways, that's going to wrap up this UI workshop. Hopefully you all learned something about custom WPF controls and can use these concepts in your own custom controls and applications. If you have any questions, criticisms, or concerns, be sure to leave them below in the comments section. Other than that, leave a like or subscribe for more. Thank you.